Hey, everybody. Welcome to the World of CONCACAF podcast. I am Eric Schmitz. I'm Jonathan Slate. And I'm Donald Wine. And we're here to talk about CONCACAF. Uh, we're going to do a news desk episode. We got a few things we're going to hit on um, as far as news around the region. But the main focus of today's podcast is you, and especially our patrons. Thank you to all our patrons who support the podcast on our Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash podcacaf. Uh, Donald, do you want to shout out our newest patron transactions? Yeah, so I'm going to start with uh, our friend Kellen Christensen, who actually was already a patron, and he moves to uh, the executive level. So uh, I guess he didn't want to be outdone by his not related Christensen <laughs> friend, uh, Jared. Uh, but uh, if your last name is Christensen, you are an executive patron member, and we appreciate it. Yeah, see, the key to being the executive is now you are eligible for the manila envelope full of cash that is known to go around CONCACAF to the executive. And, and it is manila. We, we, we <laughs> tested all the manila folders out there, and we have the best ones. Um, so there's that. But also, uh, we have another patron. His name is Philip Morgenstern. And Philip actually is a patron from New Zealand. Bruh, I don't know. <laughs> First of all, I, I want you to email us or something because I want to know what we are doing right that you in New Zealand will still <laughs> listen to us because we appreciate it. I will. I, I promise you we are coming next summer for the Women's World Cup. So get ready for us. Or we, is we it the summer? Bring... <laughs> hmm? Oh, it's going to be I summer. Said... Or yeah, I mean next winter for him, but yeah, next winter may, for him. That's right. We might touch on that in one more round. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, we we'll have some on one that. more round stuff. Which one more round is something that Philip and Kellen and all of our other patrons get to listen to on our Patreon. So patreoncom slash podcast. Please go subscribe, support our podcast. Um, let us continue doing this cool, cool stuff. Um, but appreciate all of your support. Um, but yeah, big stuff going on around Concaf and Newswire. Uh, first thing we're going to get to the FIFA U20 Women's World Cup is happening in Costa Rica right now, which is awesome. Uh, the opener, Costa Rica played Australia in like the big send off opener of the tournament. 22,506 showed up in San Jose for that. Uh, there was an absolute banger of a goal scored in that game. Uh, I know we shared the highlight, but. Um, yeah, CONCACAF has not been showing that great so far in the tournament, but I know Costa Rica is not advancing. I don't believe Mexico is either. Uh, Canada got eliminated. Um, but yeah, cool for Costa Rica. Yeah, and currently the U.S. is, uh, well, there is a game today. Uh, this is actually, so we're recording this on the on the 17th. So um, we will know um, by the time this comes out if the U.S., uh u20s made it through or not they did get absolutely worked uh the other day they lost a uh, 3-0 to to netherlands um but we we'll, so we'll see we will see uh how the how they fare uh, in the last round of the knockout the knockouts or the group stages there have been some great goals all around i think the the costa rica goal uh, is like a Puskas Award nominee, in my opinion. It's like obviously the best of the best, but there have been a lot of great, there's been a lot of great play in this U20 uh, Women's World Cup. So for those who are watching, I know uh, there have been some nice games, some some really great teams, and it shows, again, we've talked a lot on this show about the uh, the future of women's soccer and, and the growth of women's soccer. No better you know example of how far they've come uh, in a lot of ways than watching this women's world cup, the U twenties and just seeing how mature a lot of these women are playing on the field at, despite their age. Yeah. So shout out Alexandra Pinnell from Costa Rica who scored that banger. want to make sure I got her name, got her a shout out on the world of CONCACAF. I'm sure that is as important as the accomplishments of going to the FIFA U 20 women's world cup. Got a podcast shout out. All right. So that tournament's still going on. Um, moving over to the men's side, uh, Curacao, they've had, it's, it's been a tumultuous couple of years for the Curacao men's national team. Uh, Remco Bicentini back in action as the manager of the men's national team for Curacao. He replaces Art Langler, who was just named as manager in March. 
He went one win, two losses in CONCACAF Nations League and is gone. So B. Santini is back in. Uh, he was previously the manager of the program and was famously cast aside for Gus Hiddink. Um, Hiddink took over. They had Patrick Cliverton as an interim for a little bit. Uh, Langler got brought in. Wasn't that when? But, wasn't that when Hiddick had COVID and had to miss like a yep. window? Yeah, and Cliver yeah. came in as his replacement. Yeah, I mean that's it, that's the definition of an interim situation. Um, Pedigree. If, yeah, but I mean, if you're bringing a guy like Cliver, that's not too bad. But Curacao goes back to Bicentini, who had done great things with the program. Um, they're in a tough spot now. Curacao needs to beat Canada in March to avoid relegation to League B and CONCACAF Nations League. And just came out that they are going to be uh, playing Indonesia in two friendlies next month in September. I, so, I think when it comes to Curacao, right? Like the, we, we don't have to go back that long, maybe a couple of years ago where they were one of the, like, again, that next tier of teams in CONCACAF that were poised to kind of make a leap into, you know, challenging for world cups, challenging for gold cup, you know, semifinals and titles. And they've kind of gone, I won't say they've gone backwards. They've kind of gone in circles over the last year and a half. Uh, COVID probably has a lot to do with it. You know, they've been missing a lot of guys, you know, a lot of uh, players that they wanted to call in didn't come through, you know, that sort of thing. But uh, with the Olympic, they didn't make the Olympics. The, the world cup qualifying for 2026 is going to start in a couple of years for them. And they need to make sure that they're back on solid ground and stable because for a lot of teams in CONCACAF, there is no better time to qualify for the world cup than 2026, where you have the three, you know, arguably the three best programs in the region have already qualified because of the host. And then you have an additional three to five spots for CONCACAF teams to make an expanded field of 48. So Curacao, hopefully this is the start of them kind of getting their stuff together and, you know, getting back on the path that they were before. That was, you know, a really high trajectory. Yeah. Yeah. No, just going back. Yeah. COVID really did uh, do a number on them. And I, I remember, you know, as we previewed even last summer, when we were getting ready for the, you know, the ending rounds of, of World Cup qualifying before the uh, octagonal. Um, I mean, I feel like a lot of us even here felt that they were, you know, poised to make that next step up. And then, you know, hitting gets COVID and just a few other issues that unfortunately kind of kept them out. But I mean, I really hope that we see, uh, you know, see this team take a step up. I mean, they have some, you know, some got like some well-known players like, I mean, Eloy Room is, uh, you Andrew know, Andrew Bacchino. Yeah, Leandro Bacuna, uh, Cuco Martina. I mean, they have some great guys on this team. They they are, I feel, kind of in a transition phase, like a lot of um, some of these next tier down teams in CONCACAF are, where uh, they have a lot of guys in their 30s um, or like, you know, late 20s, early 30s. And so, um, you know, they're going to have to build that up before because most of the guys on this team are not going to be there for 2026. Yeah, no. And it... I mean, Curacao, we desperately want to see them stay up because we need League A of Nations League to stay strong as far as potential opponents. And Curacao is on the elite list in CONCACAF of places we want to go see games. So, you know, Curacao, well, I mean, gotta I'm get, also, gotta get the result. If they can't come up, I'm willing to go down to see. Like, I'm willing to volunteer the United States. Let's go all the way down to, to League C and then let, let's just complete CONCACAF, win League C, win League B, and then go win League A again. I, I propose we go one step further and just leave the North American uh, Football Union for the Caribbean Football Union. I okay, okay. If you, baby. Guys, let's keep this on the rails. Uh, <laughs> if, if you guys do want more information on Curacao, we did – do focus on Curacao in our fifth episode of the World of Concat podcast. So feel free to go back and listen to that. Um, some of that information is clearly not out of date with they have a new head coach. So we'll move on. Um, also down in the CFU, speaking of the CFU, 
Uh, Trinidad and Tobago will be heading to Thailand in September. They've got a couple of friendlies. They are going to participate in the King's Cup 2022 down in the Chiang Mai province of Thailand. Uh, that's going to take place from September 22nd to 25th. Uh, the participating teams in that King's Cup are Trinidad and Tobago, the hosts Thailand, Malaysia, and Tajikistan. I like this. Uh, first of all, I think for Trinidad, Trinidad Tobago, again, they're a team that has also kind of gotten off the rails a little bit and they need to get back on track with some, you know, confidence builders. I think Trinidad in a way is better than, they're definitely better than Malaysia and Tajikistan. They're probably better than Thailand, which can be a decent team at times in Asia, but it also is just spreading the gospel again of the Caribbean football union by going all the way to Thailand, bringing the bold jerseys out of storage yeah. and letting people know that, you know, Hey, maybe y'all should be coming to the Caribbean because we dress very well. And when we look good, we feel good. We can play good. Now I do want to ask just rhetorically, like, do we ever remember a time where CONCACAF has so many games against AFC? in like one month like it seems like everybody's playing asian teams in september during covid yeah i mean like it's been extremely limited and you love to see it so you'd like to see it more often but it's just something i noticed especially putting this together the u.s is obviously playing japan and uh saudi arabia um yeah it, it you love to see the other parts of the world's you know intermingling like this but we did shout out Bowl there for Trinidad and Tobago and their beautiful kits. We do have some kit notes here. We're going we're gonna to try to stay brief on this, but the big kit news is Jamaica signs with Adidas. So Jamaica, you pro- they're famously like a Kappa team. Um, they've had they some were, uh, currently with Umbro. Currently with Umbro. Think- yeah, like the- – They've always been like kind of off the beaten path as far as what brands they're working with, but now they are with the big boys. They are signing with Adidas, new kits coming. What are your initial thoughts on this, um, this new deal? I mean, without seeing like the fact that we haven't seen anything, I'm a little, I don't have a ton of thoughts, um, but I'm all, I'm just hoping that the uh, Adidas does them right. Um, They've the Adidas kits have been mixed over the past few years, as far as like you both club and national team. Like there's been some fantastic ones, um, but then there's also been some absolute stinkers. So uh, it'll really just it'll depend on. I just hope it's just not another. Um, if going to one of the big boys means that we lose a little bit of uh, the flair, and it's just another template, um, I am not uh, a fan because I think that one of the things that makes CONCACAF so great is some of the great, you know, whether that be bowl or stimulus, um, trying to think of some of the other ones. Yeah. Uh, those other ones out there, but I I'd rather see that than, uh, just another template Jersey. I think this is about money. And uh, I mean, a lot of kit deals are about money not necessarily about the creativity, uh, of things side of things, but, in the case of Adidas, they do have a lot of money that can help pump, you know, resources into Jamaicans, uh, the Jamaican program, uh, which is something that they need to kind of keep themselves at the top of, you know, the CFU. But I think one, yes, I'm with, I'm with you, Jonathan. I hope they don't lose the swag, but I do expect that to happen because Adidas is not treating them as a top tier national team yeah. outfitter. They're treating them kind of on the, on the level of like, Belgium, which Belgium has come out, I think, Jonathan, you kind of hit the nail on the head. They've come out with some decent jerseys. They come out with some that you're like, oh, okay, I can see where they're going. And they've come out with some that, are, that have been very, very bland uh, and kind of taking away from some of the swag that they used to have with their jerseys. So um, I'm just hoping that they're able to kind of bring, you know, bring some of that swag to Adidas and say, hey, we, we, we can stay within the template, but we still got to be us in a way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I as much as it pains me to say it, like Adidas's previous offerings with Arsenal as of late and Manchester United have looked pretty good. Um, uh, don't clip that, Eric. Um, <laughs> that I just but those, but those are top tier. This this you know, is on wax now. Clubs. This is on wax. Everyone. <laughs> yeah, but those are top tier clubs, right? And they're not going to be treated yeah. as a top tier club. Think yeah, of them like, but 
you well, know, I don't know. I guess that's what I'm looking for out of this is see for me, like Jamaica is such a culturally known vibe, you know, even around the world outside CONCACAF, like what I would love to see Adidas do, you know what Nike does with Nigeria where like, not like Nigeria is they're going to have great kits. It's going to be, the vibes are going to be off the charts. Everyone's going to want these things. It's like, it's not about them being, a top five team in the world. It's that they've got one of the top five looks in the world. And I think Adidas can do that for Jamaica because they've got a great color palette. They've got great cultural things that they can tie in and you just need the emphasis and the, 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 I don't know, the support from one of those big manufacturers to really push Jamaica into the limelight here in global soccer. But so Jamaica signing with Adidas. Adidas also did recently release the Mexico kits for the 2022 World Cup. Uh, I'm going to keep it brief on them. Uh, It's nice to see Mexico wearing their actual colors. You know, green green kits is what we think Mexico is. So that's good. And then just recently we had the kit, the potential kits for the U.S. men's national team in the world cup lows leaked on Twitter this week. Uh, let's try to keep it tight. What do you guys think? Of those, those ain't it. <laughs> and, and, and by it, I mean, decent. Those are. Yeah. I'm going to save a lot of my thoughts on the, well, first of all, let me talk about Mexico. I think they should always be in green. Uh, at home I, I they had a leaked one of like a year and a half ago that was going to be red but they I guess that was squashed because they couldn't wear that as an away color to the green um, the red one I, I I hate to say but the the green one looks nice um, I'm sure Me- I know Mexico fans are, are very happy with those um, and I like that feeling on the U.S. side um, very briefly on the U.S. side American Outlaws has, has jerseys out uh, via stimulus, so uh, you should try and tap into those if you're looking for World Cup jerseys. Uh, they close on the 21st, so get yours now. Yeah, uh, as you guys all know, that kits are very important to us, and we love talking about them. We want to make sure that we're giving the attention to these new kits that they deserve. So just a heads up, in the coming weeks, we're going to do a full episode about the kits of CONCACAF. Keep an eye out for that. I think we're going to, this is going to be one of our better episodes because we're going to actually go in depth and we're going to talk about these U.S. kits, which aren't great, but it's going to be the, so, it's going to be the kick, kick, cap ex- episode. Yeah. Kick, kick, so yes. Also, if, um, TM, you know, companies like bowl or stimulus, want to send us jerseys to review mm-hmm. um i we will also talk about your jerseys yeah. I, I don't even need a melina i don't even need a manila envelope full of cash just an envelope full of a jersey yeah that's podcacaf at gmail.com i'll give you jonathan shipping info we'll get them taken care of all right so we'll wrap up the news while you're there now the main focus of this episode Postcards to the pod. We really appreciate when everyone gives us feedback and asks us questions, gives us discussion points. So especially giving center stage to our patrons, uh, let's talk about what you guys want to talk about. So what I'll do is I'll read out the questions, shout out who contributed it, and I'll kick it to Donald or Jonathan to lead off discussion. Uh, first off, from our boy Marcel. Marcel, our patron, good friend of the podcast. We love you. Uh, Marcel asks, "Who do you eat? Who do each of you see as the U.S. men's national team's most important player in Qatar? McKenney and Pulisic excluded. Jonathan, who is the U.S.'s most important player in Qatar? Um, if those guys are excluded, it's uh, Anthony Robinson." Because without Anthony Robinson, there is no there there is no backup left back. Uh, I mean, the backup left back is Serginho Des. Um, so I think if maybe I 
maybe it's not most important. Maybe that's the one player that I think would affect the team the most if he got injured, because I think of what he brings on, on the left-hand side of the field. Um, I would also throw in for uh, honorable mention, probably Walker Zimmerman as well. I think having a center back that is healthy, that has played throughout qualifying with this team uh, right now, he is the only center back that has, uh, that is healthy and has played through the majority of qualifying. Um, and so I think that between those two are, are probably who I see as, um, you know, the most important players going into, uh, into the world cup that aren't McKinney or um, Pulisic or Tyler. I mean, Tyler Adams also, but Tyler Adams was not excluded. Please. Oh, he wasn't excluded. Respect my son. Um, Donald, Donald, what are your thoughts? So I, I consider, was that Tyler? Adams? I said no, Tyler I, Adams. <laughs> no, I actually, I considered a lot of guys, right? Like you mentioned, uh, Jedi, who I think is important. Walker Zimmerman, whoever lines up next to Walker Zimmerman is important. Um, Tyler Adams, obviously important. Brendan Aronson was one that I, that I hinted at, but I think the most important player is whoever lines up at the nine, because in a world cup, no one has, no one has won the world cup by not scoring. You have to score goals and you have, to, and a lot of that is having to come from somebody at the nine. The problem is for the United States is we don't know who's going to be that nine or that false nine, but that's going to be the most important position because whoever is in that role in a world cup is going to be the rely relied upon to score many goals because that is how you get out of group stages. That's how you win games. That's how you win penalty shootouts. That's how you win tournaments. That is going to be the biggest key for me. Yeah. Technically you wouldn't necessarily have to score goals to win a world cup. Well, funny you say that because for me, I'm going to go with Matt Turner because Matt Turner, not only is it massively important to have a keeper you trust someone who's going to give you confidence. We know that we don't get that confidence from Zach Steffen, like over club, over, international over the last few years like stefan's been all right but we haven't seen the lockdown holy shit this guy is a brick wall zach stefan i don't know if ever we've seen that matt turner can be that guy and if matt turner is that guy for the u.s then all of a sudden the mindset of the team changes and if they are trustworthy of the guy they've gotten goal that he's going to make a save and he's going to come up with a save when they need it then it changes the way they play the game. And if you trust your keeper and he balls out, I mean, go, what did Tim Howard do for the U.S. in all the World Cups he played? Uh, yeah. Like, but my that thing would... It's not only like the on-field impact of having a strong keeper, it's the emotional impact of, you know, not giving up goals. I guess my concern though with Matt Turner is he's probably not going to kick. He may kick, he may play one, maybe two games of soccer between now and the, uh, the world cup, which I think is a huge concern. Um, and then, um, yeah, to Donald's point about the number nine, I just don't know how, like we haven't, like we, we may not even have even seen the, the guy who starts at nine play for the U S yet. Well, I mean, like, I don't, could, I don't, like, I, I don't think that's a good answer to the question because of that. Like, you can't – it's who is going to be the most important player. If we don't know who it is, then I guess that answer could be anybody. But but that is we, important, it, though. That can, we, The most important player may not be on this team. That's what – I think that's what Jonathan's saying, and I think that could be true. And I mean, if it you could think be about Brandon it – It, it yeah, could be Brandon Vasquez. It could be Brandon Vasquez, who's never – At the end of the day – Yeah, at the end of the day, goals. Ricardo Pepe was our guy for two months then it was you know p fuck then it was ferrera there's there's been a cycle of people at the nine but we don't know who that nine is going to be and also in the to the tune of matt turner we don't know if matt turner is the most important player because matt turner may not start at the world cup because zach stefan may win out over him because honestly when you think about it in the head-to-head whenever they're both healthy Zach Turner has started over Matt Turner more times. Zach than Turner. <laughs> I'm sorry, He's Zach Zach, Zach, Zach Seven. <laughs> I, 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 I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. But yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like if Matt Turner be it shows everyone that he is that guy and he gets the job, he wins that job over Zach Stefan. 
I think that does more for the team than Zach Steffen in his I, maximum I just don't capability think there's, can do. I don't I don't think there's any way Matt Turner wins the starting job because Matt Turner wasn't starting when he was playing and now he isn't playing. And like what is he going to do to uh um, to win that, to win that job. I mean, there's not going to be anything that they're going to see between now and then. Maybe in, in the next round of of friendlies, but that's it. Um, Listen, if we got to go all Celtic pride and make sure that Matt Turner is the only keeper the Arsenal has, so that way he he actually gets minutes. You know, book me a flight. We'll we'll get it taken care of. Matt Turner is going to get his chance. FBI, don't be listening to that. <laughs> he's kidding <laughs> kidding <laughs> allegedly yeah. yeah parody you know you gotta you got put that in the tweet it says parody all satire. right satire yeah satire this is all satire wink all right uh thanks marcel for that question marcel actually had another question this is a little bit more fun we'll, we'll let donald lead off with this one which of, for each of you who is your all-time favorite u.s u.s men's national team player deuce it's easy. Slate. I mean, it's Deuce. Uh, I'm, I know that's it's the easiest not, question uh, we got. <laughs> yeah, it's the easiest question. I mean, I'll say that. I've. I mean, Eric, what about you? I mean, it's really tough. I almost went Jermaine Jones, but uh, I got to go Landon Donovan. Like <laughs> Landon was like the inspiration for me to like get fall into this so maybe i hate him for like making me like get this brain disease of like being obsessed with the u.s men's national team but yeah landon don was the one that did it he was the star and the fact that he's like such a the person that he is like yeah he's my guy i because i feel like this was a little easier um favorite cult like I, I want to say that like not as well known player who's your of of maybe someone that or maybe from my previous generation. I mean, are we talking like cup of coffee cult player or like just a not just not a like a superstar like everyone does superstar? Oh yeah. my, Jermaine Jones. For me, I think it's Clint Mathis. Like I loved Cletus. Like absolutely loved loved him. Um. But yeah, no, I mean, Jermaine Jones. Uh, Jermaine Jones is a uh, is a good one. Donald, what about you? Um, if John O'Brien didn't have his injuries, he'd be the greatest player that ever lived. Yeah, yeah. No. All right, last last one I have off a, a riff off of Marcel's question. Most obscure U.S. national team players jersey you own? Ooh, Ooh. Um, I gotta think about that because I have a lot of them. I think. I, I mean, I guess I have a Maurice Adu jersey. I'm trying to think of who else it would be like more obscure than that. The funny thing is, is for a while, because, you know, and for a long time, we haven't been able to properly get uh, men's player jerseys. I don't have a lot of them with player names on the back that are obscure because I, you know, I got a Dempsey. I got a Donovan. I got a Altidore. Um, I, the most obscure player I have is either Paul Areola or Kellen Acosta. And that's from the 2017 World Gold Cup. And the funny thing is, is the reason why I got the Kellen Acosta jersey is he's one of the guys that scored in that Ghana game the day that that jersey was released. I was at the game. He promptly played in that Gold Cup and then didn't see the field for four years. So I was like, oh, that sucks. Like that used to be my answer. But now he's he's the you know, he's the uh, CONCACAF God of of (laughs) of of shit. So, yeah. Like yeah. that man, that that is elevated up to like, oh, everyone's like, oh, you got an Acosta jersey. That's what's up. You got it back in the beginning. You knew. So yeah, I have. It. I was gonna say, preface this. I'll let Jonathan answer, but I'm pretty sure that we can both answer this question the same way. I have a Juan Algadello Waldo. It's not. Um, it's not that. <laughs> and then I the order ended up getting canceled, but I tried to buy a Dom Dwyer gold cup jersey the 2017 gold cup jersey um who played i guess he played two games ever well he played in that ghana game he scored and did the backflip 
he played two more games in, in the, the first two games of the Gold Cup and then never played for the team again. Yeah. He's, he scored in Nashville. Yeah, he scored in yeah, Nashville. US Nashville. Um, no, I thought you were going to say Darlington Nagby. I've got a Nagby jersey. I sold that Nagby jersey. Well, I guess you had it at some point. I, I guess had that's, one. that's where my head was going on that. The, the, yeah, I, I did have a Nagby one. Um, and then I, does everyone here own a Freddie Adu jersey? Because I do. I do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I will say this. I, I think deep in the bowels of, of one of my closets, either here or at my dad's house, um, I have a jersey. It's the it's a 2000 jersey, uh, 2000, the away jersey, which was red. It was like the plain red jersey. Um, it has a number four on the back. It does not have a name, which means that that jersey was worn by someone on like a U20 or a U23 national team. <laughs> I don't know who whose it is because it's it's a size 2X or something like that or a size XL. And I know nobody on the team back then were XL. So it's literally just a number. No, wait, wait, wait. Those jerseys, they actually did not have the names on the jerseys for all the games. Landon Donovan made his national team debut wearing that red jersey. If you look at the highlights from that game, the names were not on those jerseys. So whoever right. wore number four, that could be that. But it could no, be a senior but it's team not, player. Yeah, but it's not a player. It, it's, it, it has like a uh, thing that was only worn by the youth teams it wasn't a net it's not a senior oh, it's got like a patch jersey. or something yeah not a patch but it's like some sort some intricate thing that that immediately like our that friend identifies Cody was like, it as a youth yeah that it was like a a, a high youth national team jersey oh. but it's, it's blank it's number pictures. four and it well i have to i mean i have to find it like i said it's in the bowels of of a closet that I own, <laughs> either here or in Texas. If it's not here, I'm not flying to Texas to find this, find this number four jersey for you. So, I demand well, evidence now. If I find it, I'll let you know. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for the question, Jonathan. Uh, and that thanks was, that for was Marcel. Marcel. Oh, yeah. Jonathan, yeah. Yeah, Jonathan's <laughs> going off on tangents here. Uh, let's go back to our patrons, because we love our patrons. Uh, this one from our friend Ebony. Really appreciate the question and the support patron of the podcast uh what is your realistic expectation for qatar what would you consider a successful world cup and a failure world cup donald I'll let you lead off here so the failure is if we don't get out of the group i think that's the realistic expectation for this team is that they get out of the group and you know after that is kind of like what how much damage do you think they'll do in the knockout stage i think you're successful uh, if you get to the quarters, I mean, meaning you win your round of 16 game, you get to the quarterfinals or beyond, that's a successful World Cup for this. Because when you think about it, yes, they have the tools to win and, and on any given day, they can beat anyone in front of them. But I do think that this team is not being set up to necessarily go for it, right? The going for it is going to be four years from now. That's where they're going to be. The expectation is going to be try to win the thing because it's it's on home soil here is hey we missed in 2018 let's get out of the uh the group stage and let people know that hey we're back we're a force to be reckoned with and that this young core of kids is going to be four years older down the road and and are going to be poised to do something super great but let's see how great they can be this time around i so i think there's that there's a nice little sweet spot for them if they land in the round 16 we're that's that's a realistic we're cool if they do anything beyond that, I think that's successful. Yeah, I would agree that the uh, failure is failing to get out of the group. I mean, I think that's you know kind of the the bare minimum. Um, and then as far as successful, like I think I would agree quarterfinals. Um, but I also think it kind of depends on matchup specifics. Um, I mean, agreed. If uh, and I don't if we if we get knocked out of the round of sixteen, I don't know. But I would like to see us do the best out of all the CONCACAF teams. Um, I think that would be also be um, success for me. So definitely, like, if we made the quarters and let's say, you know, Costa Rica, Canada, and Mexico, none of them either made it out. of Like, they didn't either make it out of the group or didn't win the round of 16. Like, that's an even better success. But I agree. This is, this is all about experience, this World Cup. Um, and, you know getting the getting these guys the reps and then 2026 is where they're really going to go for it yeah i i think we all are looking at 2026 is like that's the one you would love to see a big run i think i can echo what you guys agree with where it's like a failure is getting not getting out of the group you need to advance 
And I think if they can find a way to win a knockout game, which they haven't done in 20 years, um, I think that could do so much for the momentum going into 2026. But on a micro level, what I would like to see, I would love to see the team finish second in the group. Because if they finish second in the group, that means your round of 16 game is an 8 a.m. Well, it'd be a 9 a.m. Eastern kickoff on Saturday, December 3rd, which is a big sports day. That's like college football conference championships. But there's nothing going on that early. The U.S. men's national team could have a weekend game that matters and have basically the floor could be theirs. And if they can play that game, because if they actually finish first in the group, they would play at 1 p.m. on Sunday the 4th, which going at one going during NFL football is probably not ideal. But if they can have center stage in the American sports landscape for a game of that magnitude, and if they can win, that would be success. Whether they go on to the semifinals, whatever. Like, I want to see the U.S. capture America's attention and do it in a way, do it by winning, pretty much. And and if, they're, and if they get out of the group, right, you know, that round of 16 game honestly is a winnable game because you're either facing Qatar, Netherlands, Senegal, or Ecuador. And mm-hmm. while, you know, Netherlands and, and uh, Senegal are both good, they're not great teams right they are unbeatable they're not they're not unbeatable they they you know that's a team that you know the u.s has played fairly well against recently so uh and then qatar we beat in the gold cup last year their gold cup adjacent uh so we got to do better than them so um uh, but yeah I, I think that that's the part is like getting out of the group is is the realistic expectation but then after that like jonathan says about matchups that matchup in the round of 16 is pretty juicy uh but then it's after that the quarterfinals where you're getting to the Argentinas and the Frances of the world. Yeah. And I mean, if they get to the point where it's like, it's a weekend game round 16 and they beat, whether that's Netherlands or Ecuador, or Senegal, whoever they beat, if they get that, mo- if they win and everyone sees that the momentum builds for that quarterfinal game. And that is the kind of thing that captures the country's attention, especially a time of year where everybody's inside and watching TV, like, the potential is there for all these young kids on the men's national team to become stars. And you would love to see it happen. All right. So thank you, Ebony, for the question. We love you. Um, Next question from our patron uh, is from our patron Reed. Uh, He says, based on history, I'd be curious what CONCACAF country with one or zero world cup appearances would each of you most want to make it in 2026. So, Obviously, with more births, there's more opportunity. Is there a cut? We talked about Curacao angling for 2026 earlier in the podcast. Reed wants to know who do we want to see make it next time around? John, come on now. I was going up and uh, leading up to this, I was going to say, leading up to this one, if had this been a few months ago, I would have said Canada. Uh, (laughs) But now they've they've, 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 now they've made a first second time and they think they're hot. They won't shut up. They won't shut up about it. You know, I I, they're claiming, you know, we've touched on this. They're claiming, uh, you know, championships that that doesn't doesn't exist and trophies that don't exist, like finishing first in the World Cup. Um, I mean, I think that if I was going to like one or, or zero, I mean, I would love to see Jamaica in the World Cup, especially Jamaica in 2026. Uh, I mean, I think that would be would be fantastic. Um, I mean, of course, I'm always going to shout out our boys in Anguilla, um, get up the Dolphins. Um, I know they actually I don't even think they can actually qualify for the World Cup, though. They yeah, can. They can. They yeah. can. Uh, everyone gets it, a man. chance. Yeah, everyone gets a chance. So, yeah, the, but yeah, the wonder no, of global Anguilla. soccer. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, Jamaica is probably the big one for me, though. Donald? Because they've on made now. one. Come on now. Y'all know what it is. It's Vincey Heat, baby. Like, it right. will be great because the vibes, you know, the Jersey vibes would be, you know, take that World Cup to another level and make people need to really just reevaluate how they address their Jersey situation. Uh, but Vincey Heat does the same thing. And, you know, St. Vincent, 
they're more realistic than Anguilla. And the fact that, you know, again, you know, around here or there, a, a match here or there, a draw here or there, and they could be put into a, into a position to make the World Cup. You know, it, it, but again, it always comes down to how they do on the field. But they've had some decent performances over the last few years. They've just coming up short. And I think, you know, that would be the one I'd want to see. Because if they did that, look, if they don't do the steel, uh, the steel drum, uh, rhythm, Nash. anthem nah. <laughs> at, at the at the World Cup here, I mean, I'll play it in the stadium if I have to. I will put it on the loudspeaker. I'll bring it. I'll I'll bring it. I'll cut a bootleg CD and put it on there. But I hope that's being played somewhere in the United States yeah. during the World Cup. Yeah. So my thing with so my my thing with I I've thought about Saint Vincent, but I was more thinking about the uh, the Jamaican diaspora throughout the United States and the amount of people that would be at those games and just the vibe oh, yeah. of a of a uh, Jamaican World Cup game would be just immaculate. I mean, there are multiple Concacaf countries that would fall into that category. I mean, Cuba and the World Cup. You'd see a lot of support around the U.S. for that. Um, Haiti, you'd see. Puerto Rico. Um, yeah, like, I think there is that element to, like... Who, DR? Yeah. I mean, like, who, there is an element to who are the type... Like, what country has, like, the expat population where it's, like, it almost be, like, a home team for them. And I think you get elements of that. Um I mean, shout out Windward Islands for Donald. He stole, he stole Vince E for me. But for me, like, when I was thinking about the answer to this question, I thought about the teams that you kind of expect to make it with the expanded pool and knowing that Canada, Mexico, and U.S. are going to be in. Like, you assume Costa Rica is going to be in. I think Panama, you can probably assume, is going to be in. Honduras, you probably assume, is going to be in. Um so it comes down to like, is there a fringe Central American team that you think really needs that boost? Or are we looking to the CFU be like, who's our next star? Um, Curacao could be one, but I honestly think Trinidad and Tobago might be my selection because they ha- have their one World Cup appearance. They were there in 2006. Um, you know, that, that, program has been through a lot you would love to see um you would just love to see that program succeed especially in spite i I want jack warner to not be able to go to a world cup game because if it's in the u.s he ain't coming because he he, his ass going to prison but jack warner sucks (laughs) you heard him yeah Steal down thunder. We have, we have one Jack Warner sucks guy on this podcast. That his name is. Listen, Donald there was oh, no, no one three was making. Them. Yeah, there was no one also making the move. Here's my thing about Jack Warner in 2026. Um, will he be alive? Uh, I would want hope not. Them, I mean, but that ruins some of it because <laughs> I want him to be alive and not be able to be there. Yeah. That's true. It, it's kind of like a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Yeah. Situation. Yeah. I don't know. All right. Thank you, Reed, for the question. That That's good. I, I do look forward to CONCACAF getting more bids and some of these countries getting getting into the spotlight because you know UEFA ain't paying enough attention to CONCACAF. You know AFC ain't paying enough attention to CONCACAF. Like, we want these... Concave nations be more globally relevant. That's why we have a podcast to talk about them. So thank you, Reed. Uh, we have one more submission. Uh, James K on Twitter said, Sac Republic are one game away from the CONCACAF Champions League. And I don't think that's a question. It's more of a statement. But I do think it's an interesting topic because, yes, in the U.S. Open Cup, Sacramento Republic, a USL championship team, the second division in the U.S., is going to be going up against MLS side, Orlando City, um, Mm -hmm. in the U.S. Open Cup final for a spot in the CONCACAF Champions League. What are are your feelings towards lower division teams getting into a tournament like this? I mean, I was going to say I didn't realize that the uh, U.S. Open Cup was still going on because I thought it was canceled at the once the quarterfinal teams were drawn. They just 
canceled it never nothing ever happened from there um if anyone hasn't guessed that's when nashville went out um but i mean i th- i'm always in support of it um i think I, my biggest concern is going to be the um financial cost to a team like this um to you know to do like to play in in the nations not nations league in champions league because i mean that is going to be a Huge jump in, in in just you know the logistical costs of of something, and I don't know what the the financial windfall will be for them. But I mean, I'm always down to see uh, see second division teams and making uh making their way into you know larger uh, confederation wide competition. Yeah, I I'm cool with it. I I hope they win. Um, because it'd be cool to see, uh, you know, just Sac- you know Sacramento or, or just a team from USL compete in the uh concaf champions league but i I also think that this is the only way that they should be able to qualify is through a you know open tournament like like the u.s open cup is so um i don't think that we should be going to usl and saying hey take the champion put him in in champions league Uh, agreed or or take like the lower division you know of any any you know nation and putting them in because that's just not how it works um so I would say that's the only way they can qualify. But if they do qualify, hell yeah, put them in. So I'm hoping the Sacramento does it. Yeah. I mean, for me, the, the cool thing would be, would be for a good gauge of where USL championship level is compared to all the other leagues in the region. So if you get a USL championship team playing your league MX teams, even the top leagues around uh, CONCACAF, the top teams from those leagues, you get more of a sense of where they slot in as far as level of play. And I think that could be a huge, huge boost for USL if Sacramento Republic gets into CCL and balls out because then all of a sudden it's like, oh, this league's actually pretty good. There's like 30 plus teams that we can go play for and get good opportunities and play at a high level. And you I mean, you, you've seen what the growth of pro soccer in the U.S. has done for CONCACAF in general just by get, providing opportunity for professional environments for players from all of these countries. And it's almost like a marketing pitch for the entire league if Sacramento Republic can get in there and do some things. So thank you, James K. on Twitter for that. Uh, really appreciate everyone that sends in postcards to the pod. We love talking about this stuff. We love having interesting topics. Uh, so shout out Marcel, Ebony, Reed, and James for all your contributions and for listening to the, our dumb little podcast about soccer in the in North America, Central America, and the Caribbean. We're going to wrap it up here. Uh, we'll have one more round for all of our patrons on Patreon. Uh, you can sign up become a member uh, patron and executives at patreon.com slash podcast. Uh, we really appreciate all the support we get there. Make sure you follow us on Twitter pay, at, <laughs> at podcast at so, Patreon. Hey, at, <laughs> fucking it's been 30 some episodes and I'm not even getting this out. Right. Uh, Twitter at podcast, Instagram at podcast, uh Facebook backslash podcast, you know, all that stuff. Shoot us an email, podcast at gmail.com. Donald, where can they find you? At Blazing DW. Uh you can also find my writing over at stars and stripes at c.com. And Jonathan's on mute, but he would love to tell you that he is where I am on <laughs> J Slate SSP. Uh and then you can find my writing on Broadway Sorts Media as well. Yeah. Jonathan with all the hot info on the Nashville SC team that is struggling right now. Um, Absolutely but yeah. struggling. Thank you for everyone for tuning in. We've got a kit watch special coming in the coming weeks. So look out for that. And yeah, the September window is approaching rapidly for both the women and the men. So a lot to talk about And the world cup is we're within a hundred days. Holy shit. So Let's talk some World Cup on one more round. So see you later.